If you're curious to hear a little music from our guest Carla Lucero, who we spoke to in our most recent episode, check out E4TT's annual concert of music by women and non-binary composers, Midnight Serenades, on January 25th. Welcome to For Good Measure, an interview series celebrating diverse composers and other creative artists sponsored by a grant from the California Arts Council. I'm Nanette McGinnis, Artistic Executive Director of Ensemble for These Times. In this week's episode, we continue our conversation with Erica Oba, who we spoke to in May 2022. Has your music been influenced by your experience as a Japanese-American woman? And if so, how? I think so, yeah. I mean, my, I, my parents both immigrated from Japan, so... I feel like culturally I grew up in a fairly Japanese household and I feel like that, you know, that's just who I am and intractable from who I am as a person. Um, And I think, um, yeah, I think consciously and unconsciously it, it, it does inform the work that I do. And some of it, you know, is in just like thematic content and you can maybe see that sometimes even just like in like, um like titles and that kind of thing uh but also like aesthetically i do i do think that um you know that has informed <laughs> where i'm coming from and you know i wasn't trained in any particular like traditional japanese music traditions but um you know there are uh like different japanese music traditions that are around me so i feel like you know some of that has been absorbed um my my mother for a while was studying okinawa sanshin music that's the three string um okinawa like banjo and i you know i love that music and uh there was a period of time when you know i was hearing quite a bit of it cuz my mom was doing it and you know she was playing with local people and um, it was a fabulous local Sanshin player who was leading these groups. And uh, I, I was so fascinated with that specific tradition. So I, I feel like for uh, Sanshin music, I've like definitely, you know, deliberately pulled like, uh, like not just musical content, but just like ideas about musical form and ways of like organizing music and ideas that I've tried to incorporate into some of my music. Um, and then... I also used to play (laughs) briefly, I played like the traditional Japanese bamboo flute, the fue, with a local taiko group. (laughs) And uh, (laughs) that that was also just super fun. And um, and it was a it was like mostly older, retired women who were just like super buff and, you know, (laughs) really fit going with these huge taiko drums. And (laughs) <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for for that tradition too, I think I got a lot out of just seeing, you know, different ways of conceptualizing music and how they communicate and organize musical ideas is you know, it's its own language and tradition that's different from, you know, kind of the more traditional Western music traditions that I went to school for. Um so I feel like both of those things, just being in those spaces, I like absorbed some things and tried to um you know, approach my music, uh, you know, from, from those angles too. It was like, oh, well, like if we're not coming at it from necessarily like notated music, how do people like learn these really complex long things by ear? And it's like, oh, that's how they do, you know? So, uh, yeah, I think those things have continued to influence how I think about music. And I've written a couple pieces where I was trying to kind of emulate, um, the communal playing style so it's you know it's uh non-hierarchical so it's not like you have a conductor and then you have to but they can still have these like pretty complex large ensembles doing things so I've written a couple pieces where I was like okay well how can I model this to you know to varying degrees of success I don't know that it's always successful but it it's been an interesting process and practice for me so I'll probably keep experimenting with these things um for the taiko groups, I mean, I think part of it is just that they train themselves to have incredibly good memories. <laughs> um, and they, they have, you know, these pretty complex rhythmic patterns and beat cycles that they'll just like, 
learn and then like internalize and it's almost like dance actually because a lot of it's very physical too um if you've ever seen taiko drums so a lot of it's like choreographed (laughs) yeah it's kind of like choreography too and um i was certainly never able to memorize things to the degree that they could so i was always like translating what they were doing and like writing out (laughs) notes for myself so that I could like follow the map but you know they would like go for like 20 minutes and they'd just like have it in their brains which I find very impressive. (laughs) You mentioned different forms and structures. Yeah or like just ways of approaching um, I guess like musical form and like tonality even so with the three string banjo like you're not necessarily playing chords right so you just have these three pitches that you're working off of. And then um, it's usually like a counterpoint line against whatever you're singing. So um, yeah, like even just that (laughs) as a musical like structure starting point was interesting for me. Um, So yeah, I I would say like, even when I'm writing like string quartet music, I'll like some of that tonality is in my ear and in my brain while I'm trying to you know explore different ideas not necessarily to try to like emulate it but just as like you know one one way of approaching sound and music (laughs) that Mm -hmm. I, I, I find very generative yeah an expanded timbral universe yeah you recently collaborated with Meredith Monk what an amazing opportunity what was that experience like it was one of like the the more magical things I think I've gotten to do in my life. She was just so, such a wonderful presence. And I think she takes mentorship really, really seriously and was just so generous in her energy. And um, her music was just, I, I don't know that I've played music on flute that felt so physically good to play. Um, just like the way like playing her lines resonated in my body while I was playing them felt good and uh, how it resonated with everybody else doing their parts. It was, it was just a, a really wonderful experience. And it was my first big live performance that I'd done since the pandemic. So I feel like I got very, very lucky that, you know, I can ease my way back into performance with this kind of amazing ensemble and music opportunity. Thank you for listening to For Good Measure, and a special thank you to our guest, Erica Oba, for joining us today. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to our podcast by clicking on the subscribe button and support us by sharing it with your friends, posting about it on social media, and leaving us a rating and a review. To learn more about E4TT, our concert season online and in the Bay Area, or to make a tax-deductible donation, please visit us at www.e4tt.org. This podcast is made possible in part by a grant from the California Arts Council and generous donors like you. Four Good Measures produced by Nanette McGinnis and Ensemble for These Times and designed by Brennan Stokes. With special thanks to audio engineer extraordinaire Stephanie Newman. Remember to keep supporting equity in the arts and tune in next week for Good Measures. Measure.